So my name is Danielle and I'm a space and robotics engineer and I am so excited to be talking with you today and so honored that uh, even I have an ASL interpreter. So thank you, Aaron. That's awesome. Um, and it makes me really happy that uh, Skype a Scientist is being as accessible as possible. And I just want to say, Sarah, I think you've done an amazing job with everything. So I hope everyone's enjoying this, this series. So like a lot of you, I've been in quarantine for about five weeks now. And it's been reminding me of another experience I had as an analog astronaut. So you may think we're all sitting at home right now, but actually we're learning great skills for how to be an astronaut. So first off, what is a space analog? So I never went to space, um, but analog astronauts uh, participate in missions on Earth and we are pretending we're in space, but we're not actually in space. So the reason we might do this, um, oh, for some reason this is cut off. Okay, there we go. Uh, is it cut off still? It doesn't look cut off to me. Okay, perfect. Um, so for analog astronaut missions, uh, they let humans prepare or practice for some part of the space mission without actually being in space. So different missions have different team themes, like um, one mission might be testing the psychology or how do we, how do we think about uh, isolation or how do we think about exercise in space or nutrition. And basically it's like space camp. So if anyone's been to space camp, it's pretty much like that, but for adults and we, we bring in uh, some other experiments and we, we test, sometimes we even test tools that will go up onto the International Space Station. So here's uh, so like like space camp we uh, we have operations that we might want to do or experiments or we might be testing something, and I wanted to take a little time to talk about some of the really cool different uh, analog astronaut places that exist around Earth. So one of them is under the water. So this is NEMO, the NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations, and I'll. Actually, a lot of astronauts and even astronaut teams will go down to the NEMO research station so that they can test out things and work on their team cohesion. Another one that's run by NASA is called HERA. And this one's down in Texas at the NASA Johnson Space Flight Center. And these are usually two week missions uh, where they're, and they, they also have different types of themes, like they might be doing a nutrition study or they might be looking at what types of teams work best together. Another one also in the US is High Seas out in Hawaii. And some of these have been very long. So some of these have been three months or even up to a year. And they're out in a beautiful part of Hawaii that in, at some, it sometimes the day actually does look like Mars. But of course, the US is not the only place that does these. In, uh, in China, there's Lunar Palace in Beijing. It's at the Beihong University of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And one of the things that they looked at in their missions was how, how do we grow things in space or how, uh, how do we get the, the crew involved with growing? Another really, uh, really great one was the Mars 500 mission. And this was actually a 520 day mission. And this, this all happened in Russia. So it was an international crew of three Russians, uh, two folks that represented the European Space Agency and one person from China. So they, they also had a very international crew. And for theirs, they actually simulated the entire Mars mission. So uh, over a year in transit, and then a two week Mars mission, and then all the way coming back. So this, this picture is from the, the Mars part. A smaller one in the US is called the Mars Desert Research Station. And this is actually the one that I got a chance to participate in a few years ago. So this was my crew and uh, we were all, from all over the world. So we had someone from France and Germany and uh, Australia, the UK and, a, and from the US. So we had a really wonderful international team, which was really, really fun. And one of the things that we did uh, every day is we all made a schedule together. So who needed to go out on EVA? Who was going to be doing the cooking? Uh, what, what sort of things did we need to do that day? And we rotated all the tasks like lab cleanup or cooking. We did yoga and meditation and exercise. And we had to carefully prepare every time we went outside. We needed to have our space helmets on so that we could go out into Mars. So this was just a simulation. We didn't, nothing bad would have actually happened if, if we hadn't put our helmets on, but this was helping us get in the mindset. And so these are some, some fun pictures. 
And uh, we, we all, every day we worked on our projects and did experiments. Uh, we got to look through the telescope. I got to play with this little rover. Uh, we played games with our team. We even made art. Every single night, all of us would come together and do some shared activity as a group. And most importantly, we took care of each other. We laughed a lot. We had a lot of fun. And we did miss our family and friends. It was isolating at times to be so far away. And actually, two of us had our birthdays during this time period. But it was really amazing because in our own way, we, we got to contribute just a little bit to the overall goal of space exploration. So even though these analog missions are only practice, they help scientists and astronauts, or scientists and engineers get into the astronaut mindset. We get to be part of something bigger than ourselves, helping humanity figure out how do we go to Mars, how do we go to the moon. And right now, we, me, you, and all of our friends have a really, really, really important mission, keeping our friends, our family, and our communities safe. Just like the astronauts on the International Space Station, we have to be isolated right now, but at least we get to do that together. In the meantime, this is a great time to think about how you would live like, just like an astronaut. Make a schedule, help your family with daily chores and tasks like cooking and cleaning, prepare to go outside, exercise, maybe even learn something cool, and have fun and be there for each other. Now's a wonderful, wonderful time to make a goal because we're all in quarantine. Maybe you want to learn something like a new coding language or maybe you wanna help make masks for people in hospitals. Those are all really wonderful things that you can be doing right now. And in the meantime, even though you can't go to space right at this moment, maybe one day, uh, but another thing you can do right now is you can send a postcard to space. So if you go to clubforthefuture.org, you can, you can uh, draw a postcard and send it, send it to the, those folks, and they'll actually send it up on one of the New Shepard rockets and then mail it back to you. So that's a really fun program that you can actually do from your homes right, right now. Uh, so thank you very much to all the wonderful websites that put up photos that I've used in this presentation, and I am really excited to hear all your questions. Great. Okay, sweet. Um, so stop sharing your screen now. Um, just a heads up for everybody. Um, it seems like Zoom and Chromebooks don't work well together. And I wish I had a reason as to why. Um, it's, so Chromebooks have, have seen a couple problems. One, um, it has trouble seeing our ASL interpreter. And the other problem um, is that you can see the Q&A even though um, we are, are have our settings say that you can't. <laughs> so um, I, I wish I had an explanation there. We're talking with Zoom to make it better, but this is uh, where we are. But anyway, let's get into the to the questions. So um, the Conlin has a question. Do you have stairs in zero gravity? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so you don't necessarily have stairs, but you could have a ladder or and something that uh, that we have on the International Space Station is there's these handles everywhere that the astronauts use to propel themselves from one part of the station to another. But if there's no gravity, you don't really need stairs. Sounds good. Um, does the ocean look extraterrestrial to you? Uh, I think, well, I, I've, so I've never been to space. I've only participated in the, the analog space uh, mission. But uh, I think there are some creatures down in, the o down, down in the ocean that look absolutely wild. And it's kind of incredible to think that we actually share a planet with these creatures. So some of them do look pretty, pretty amazing. And actually, I'm gonna say Sarah is gonna be your expert on that because as our Dr. Squid, <laughs> she, she's gonna know everything about, about the ocean. Yeah, I know a lot about the ocean, but I don't know anything about space. <laughs> So, um, Powers combined. <laughs> cephalopods um, are the most alien-like species that we have um, because they diverge so, so long in evolution from us. Um, and so, in a sense, you can see what a different evolutionary track can kind of look like. But cephalopods have been on Earth for 500 million years, and so they are 
kind of the original earthlings like they're more earthly than than almost we are um not really we're all earthlings but um you know we'll never know what looks like space until we go to space and we see life elsewhere so tough question for sure um steph an eighth grade teacher would like to know how long were you out there on this project so this particular project was only two weeks so that's pretty typical for the mars desert research station but for some of the ones like in the uh, high seas in hawaii those have gone up to a year and sometimes uh, i think a pretty reasonable time frame that i've seen a, a fair amount is like three months or six months or nine months so some of these are actually very long duration missions. Awesome. Uh, next question, uh, what is space food like? Ooh, um, so I've, I've only seen space food in museums and, and like at NASA centers and stuff like that. Um, so space food is where they try to dehydrate it as much as possible. So every time we send something up to space, it, it, takes, it takes mass, it takes weight. And so it's, it's hard to get it off the, off the earth. So if we can extract as much water as possible before we send it up, then we can send more food. And it also helps with preserving that food. So when, when food gets up to space, it's actually really, really dry and brittle. So one of the, th one of the first things the astronauts have to do is infuse it with water and then heat it up. And so that's, uh, so that's, that's space food. And so that's actually why I showed that picture of all of our dried fruit food. That was actually lots of vegetables and all sorts of things, but it was, it was all dried and so it could stay for a very long time. Awesome. Um, is it possible to simulate zero gravity? Grant, age 10, would like to know. Well, Grant, age 10, that is a great question. Um, on Earth, it is very difficult to simulate zero gravity, uh, but you can, you can for just a second. So we have these things called drop towers. So these are really, really tall towers, like really tall. And then you can drop something from the top of that tower. And then just for a, a fraction of a second, it, it experiences zero gravity on the way down. So there's, there's a tower like this in Germany. There's, uh, there's smaller ones, other places. There's actually a fair number. So that's one way we can, we can do zero gravity for a very, very short period of time. For longer periods, uh, we can do things like parabolic flights. So this is actually something that you might even get to do in, in college or graduate school. Um, so you, you do these flights and they follow a, a parabola and at, when you're at the top of the parabola, everyone on the plane experiences weightlessness for maybe 30 seconds. And then it goes, it, it goes in kind of this, this pattern. So at the bottom of the curve, you actually experience two times gravity. So you, you can kind of do both. Um, so you can do experiments on these, on these types of flights. And aside from that, sometimes there are special satellites that are specifically for zero-g type experiments. And so sometimes these go up and, and have, uh, they might do experiments with small animals or something like that. And then the International Space Station, of course. Right. Um, is there any research on how zero gravity affects joint issues like arthritis? Oh, that's a great question. There is a lot of research on that. Um, that's not something I've studied a lot, but, um, but yes, and one of the things that they've been really careful about for the astronauts is making sure that when they come back to Earth that they're still healthy. And that's actually one of the reasons that exercise is really, really important. So they do all these different types of resistive exercises to keep their, their muscles and their bones really strong while they're in space. Great. Um, how do they pick who will go on these missions? That is a great question. Um, so they pick from the astronaut corps so these are all of the active astronauts. And after astronaut candidates finish their training, then they can be part of the astronaut corps and they can be selected for missions. Uh, usually astronauts train for a couple years in order to go up. So, um, so it's, it's a very long, long process and they pick from folks all over the world. Cool. Um, Raphael would like to know, what time zone is it in the International Space Station? Mm, that's a good question too. Um, they... I can't remember which time zone they're in, but sometimes they have to adjust their time zone because of something that's coming and maybe there's gonna be a SpaceX Dragon capsule that's gonna come with, um, with some, some supplies or maybe, and, and so depending on when that timing is, they actually have to adjust their sleep cycle and their, their work schedule. So time, time zones can change on the International Space Station. Cool. 
Um, how accurately does isolated living help with the actual variables that one faces in missions? So it, it's not the same. It's what it is good for is team cohesion, figuring out uh, some of the, the tools that we might need. But kind of to the, the question earlier, you know, we don't get to experience zero gravity. And there is, there's a, there is a different mindset being in isolation, but it's not completely like being an astronaut because you really are still safe. I mean, if something had happened to us in the middle of the Utah desert, we would have been far from a hospital, but we could have just gotten the car and driven to a hospital. That's not the same as when you're actually in space and you really have to uh, do absolutely everything to take care of what, what would be a real emergency. Cool. So it's similar, um, but not the same. Totally, yeah. Um, what's it like being in the position that you're in today? Isaac is 13 and it's his dream to be uh, in the science profession and would like to know. Uh, I think it's a really great time. I mean, right at the moment we've got coronavirus, but I think if you're young right now and you're studying, it's a really, really exciting time. We're talking about going to the moon and then going on to Mars after that. And so I think it's a great time to be in the space industry. Cool. Um, Teddy asks, how do you feel about the Artemis project? And can you explain what the Artemis project is? Sure. Um, so the Artemis mission is going to be uh, a collaboration between NASA and many other countries where we bring humanity back to the moon. So actually sometime soon we should be hearing about what companies might be getting awards for, uh, for actually performing those missions. And we've, we've started to hear a little bit. So uh, stay tuned basically, but it's, it's, a, it's a mission going back to the moon. Cool, that's awesome. I didn't know we were even doing that. Um, how did you shower? Oh, um, yeah, it was actually a little hard because we were very limited on our water, just like you would be on a real mission. Uh, so we didn't shower as often as I normally would. I usually shower every day. But um, in days off, we would focus on key areas or, and I think I only wash my hair um, about once, once per week. Um, so for that, I had a big bucket and I uh, was trying to get everything in. And I used uh, dry shampoo in between for, for other days. So very carefully. <laughs> yeah. And with as little water as possible. For sure. Um, let's see. Would, could people bring animals into space? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Actually, we have brought lots of animals into space because, and especially up to the International Space Station, because we're really curious about how animals and humans react to the space environment. So we've brought everything from fish to spiders to, well, of course, humans, um, monkeys. So all sorts of animals have been in space. Cool. Um, what was your favorite part of your mission, Emma would like to know? Hmm. I think probably the EVAs where we would, uh, we would go outside our habitat and uh, perform our experiments out in the, in the desert. That was really fun. Cool. Um, how do you exercise in space? So in space, they actually have a few machines up on the International Space Station, but it's a lot of resistive exercise. So if we think about it, when we're maybe running or walking on Earth, we have gravity pulling us down. So that is, that's kind of where the exercise is. But in space, they actually have a belt um, that you can put around your, your waist. And so that, that kind of pulls you down to simulate what, what gravity would do. And um, they, they also do a lot of exercises where you might have your feet on a platform and then do, do push-ups push or, um, or bench presses so that you can basically use your body weight and use platforms to simulate uh, gravity. But it's, it's, uh, it's, definitely, uh, it's definitely different. And uh, sometimes, sometimes museums have, have setups where, where it shows astronautic exercise equipment. Cool. Um, Anonymous says, I want to be a NASA scientist when I grow up. Do you have any advice? Uh, study hard and stay in school. <laughs> I think um, one, of the, one of the really cool things about science at NASA is there are so, so many different ways you can get involved. So there's, there's everything from studying how does dust move around on the lunar surface to uh, what happens to our bodies in space and everything in between. So whatever you're interested in, related to science, there's going to be something there. Awesome. Um, what languages are helpful to know on these multicultural missions? 
Oh, that's a great question. So astronauts actually all learn Russian when they're when they fly on the Soyuz rocket. So Russian would definitely be one. Um, for European Space Agency astronauts, they are required to learn English and another European language. So maybe English and French, for example. Um, our partners on the International Space Station right now are the US, Russia, Canada, uh, the European Space Agency, uh, JAXA, Japan, and I believe that, I hope I didn't leave anybody out. Um, and so those are, those are some languages that would help right now. But I think uh, China's got a big program. They, they actually have their own space station now, so Chinese would be another language. And in the future, we may have even more languages up in space, which will be a really wonderful thing. But I think at a minimum, English is good because it, it often is a common language. But if you're going to a space station that's owned by the Russians or by the Chinese or by someone else, then you're going to want to, want to know that language as well. Awesome. Um, how can we simulate space at home? Well, you actually are right now because we have to be really careful when we go outside, right? We have to put on masks. All right. I mean, I know people are coming in from all over the world, so maybe, maybe things are not the same where you live, but at least where I live, we put on masks and we're really careful about what clothes we wear outside. We take our shoes off when we come back inside. So it's actually not so different. Cool. Um, Emma would like to know how many people are in the current astronaut pool? Oh, that's a good question. I, I'm not 100% sure. I think it's something like 200. Sounds good. And this is just a housekeeping reminder. If you ask the same question more than twice, I won't ask your question because you're being disruptive uh, to the group. Um, this is uh, maybe a question you don't know the answer to. And if you don't know, that's totally fine. But I'm going to ask it anyway. Is Beetlejuice going to explode? Oh, um, I don't know. I'm not an, I'm not an expert in that. Um, I, I think Sarah, Sarah is on Twitter. Yeah, Seraphina. So, yeah. <laughs> Seraphina Nance, she's, uh, she knows what's up. Um, yeah. I don't know if Beetlejuice is going to explode. I don't know anything about space, I, like I said before, but uh, she's definitely the person to go to for questions about Beetlejuice. Yeah, I think she said not soon is the last thing I saw, but okay, cool. definitely ask her. Awesome. Um, Let's see, uh, what's your favorite belt in space, like meteor belts? Do you have a favorite belt? That's from Perrin, age seven. I love that question. It is a great question. I, I only know of one belt, to be honest. Yeah, I think I'm going to say the asteroid belt because I think we have no idea what's out there and there could be lots of really cool things. There's, there's some things that are even bigger than some of our planets, like, uh, like Ceres. So I, I think we have no idea what's out there and it would be really fun to explore. Awesome. Um, are you able to get allergies in space? So I think probably yes, because I'm, allergies are when your body reacts not great to something in the environment. And you know, at, over time, astronauts have been going back and forth to the International Space Station for over a decade now, a couple decades. So in that time, there could be something that someone was allergic to that got brought up. Cool. Um, let's see. Have you ever done any uh, zero gravity stuff? And is that fun to float? So I have not. Um, but I'm really hoping to get to do a parabolic flight in the next couple of years. Do you get motion sick? Not, not super. Yeah, me either. That's awesome. Uh, you can take medicine too. So that, that I've helps. heard <laughs> that that plane is sometimes called the vomit comet because <laughs> it's just like brutal. Yeah, no, I've, I've heard the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. How do astronauts go to the bathroom from Emma? Oh, well, Emma, um, it's a little complicated. So each astronaut has their own, um, their own filter. And there's, there's a toilet on, so in, on the International Space Station, there's a Russian toilet and a US toilet. And I've heard that the Russian toilet is better, so. Noted. Yeah, if just, just in case. Option. Yeah. You never know when that kind of information is gonna come in handy, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, <laughs> But each, each astronaut gets their own filter so that, um, so that it's clean for them. That's good. Um, how many people can go on a spaceship? Oh, it depends on the spaceship. So uh, the space shuttle, for example, could take seven people, but the Soyuz um, takes three. So I think, uh, I think Crew Dragon's going to take six. Cool. Um, do you know what SpaceX is doing with their most recent BFR spacecraft? I do not, but I'm really excited to find out. Cool. 
I don't even know what that question means. I am like, oh, it's it's their it's a really big rocket. Oh, okay. Um, so so Elon Musk had announced a couple years ago that uh, they were thinking about using the BFR rocket as a point to point around the U or around the world, which would drastically cut down um, travel time. Like instead of being twelve hours, it might be thirty minutes. Um, and they were going to use that same rocket to go to Mars. So that was the announcement a couple years ago. But I don't know what's going on now. Okay, that's wild. Um, how, and this is not necessarily the question again that I expect you to know the answer to, but what would be the difference in like um, fuel efficiency of that? Would that be like way more fuel and CO2 emissions or would you be emitting it in space? Like what's, do you have any idea? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I haven't done that calculation myself, but I actually had some friends that were working on it. And so I really should follow up with them and ask. Um, I think in terms of fuel per person, it would be more fuel per person, but in terms of the speed, if you really had to go somewhere really fast, it's it would be really it would be really fast. Really fast. Okay, cool. Um, Nish wants to know. Uh, oh wait, no. What? Sorry. Can you simulate Mars gravity by putting springs on your feet? Oh, maybe. Um, I've seen I've seen simulations of gravity where you get yourself into a harness. Um, I was in Hong Kong actually, and in their Hong Kong Space Museum, they had they had a, a moon simulation, and so you you had this kind of harness, and you were you were hopping along, in uh, along a you know, little hallway that they had. So you so you, you can uh, you can simulate gravity that way, and sometimes in robotics, we'll we'll hang uh, strings down to to lighten the the load. Cool. Um, Emma would like to know: uh, Do you want to go to space, and if so, where would you want to go? Uh, yes, I think me and everyone else in the space industry wants to go to space. And I would, I mean, anything, anywhere we're going right now is, is really cool. We're going to the moon, we're going to Mars, and maybe a couple hundred years from now, we might be going places like Europa or the asteroid belt. So I think there's a lot of really cool stuff coming up. Yeah. Could you tell us why Europa is cool? Oh, so Europa is um, one of the moons of the outer planets, and it we think that it actually has an ocean underneath the crust. So underneath the, the rocky part, or, or maybe it's or the icy part, there's, there's supposed to be this giant ocean underground. And so maybe there's even some cephalopods living under there. <laughs> so we really have no idea at all. And so one of the cool things that's going on right now is uh, NASA JPL is putting together a mission to go and explore Europa. And I, I'm really, really excited about that one. Awesome. Um, okay, we, we want to go back to toilets for a minute because okay. this is important stuff. Um, is. <laughs> first of all, what does the toilet look like? And also, what is uh, the filter for? Like, what, like I'm afraid to ask, but, but uh, we've got an age 9 and age 11 person that need to know what is the filter for. Okay, so it kind of looks like, um, at least the, the mock-up I've seen um, for the, the International Space Station, um, or, um, or maybe it was the, the space shuttle. It looks like a little shelf that's about, you know, the level that you'd sit down. And then it's got a lid on it so that it can stay closed. And then um, it, it basically sucks whatever is coming out of you away. And so the filter is for whatever is touching your body. And it sucks away any, anything that you might be uh, excreting. Wild, cool, weird, and gross. I love that. Um, yep. Do you have any solar powered spacecrafts? Uh, yes, we, we have satellites that are solar powered. Um, sometimes uh, rovers are designed to be solar powered. So yes. Cool. How long does it take to get to the moon? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it depends how fast you're going. But uh, the Apollo missions, for example, took uh, two or three days. Awesome. Um, what does it feel like to take off? I know you haven't experienced it, but still. Yeah, the, the closest I've experienced is at the Kennedy Space Center. They've got a, uh, a rocket simulator. And apparently they, they pulled in some astronauts and, um, to, to mimic the feel. And it, it feels like lots of vibrations everywhere. But if you're ever in Florida, definitely go, go to the Kennedy Space Center so you can check it out. Awesome. Um, what is the difference between your job and an astronaut's job? Uh, there are lots of differences. So um, my job, over time has changed, but um, right now it's preparing astronauts to go to space. So astronauts are the ones that actually do the experiments on the International Space Station or, uh, or might take a tool that we make on Earth and then put it out the airlock so that it can, it can be outside. 
Um, so my, my job is very cozy in, in a lab, um, not, not in a very extreme environment, but astronauts are up actually doing the physical labor up in space. Cool. Do you know what the next mission that we're going to be undertaking is? So something I'm really excited about that is coming up at the end of May, I believe it's May 27th, is astronauts are going to launch from the SpaceX um, platform for the first time. And they're, they're actually going to launch astronauts from, from U.S. soil to the International Space Station. And that's going to be the first time that happens in a really long time. So that's really exciting. So May 27th. Awesome. Um, how do you land a spaceship? in zero gravity or is that like or is there's zero gravity only when you're going in between two places oh that's a good question so zero gravity is actually only when you're going between the places so when you're landing you have whatever the gravity is of that planetary body so if we're landing on earth then one gravity of earth if you're landing on the moon it's one sixth gravity if you're landing on mars it's about one third gravity the hardest actually is if you were landing on an asteroid because those have the they're, they, they have the smallest mass so that it has the least gravity. And a couple missions have tried to do things like that, um, like the Hayabusa mission, uh, and ESA had one that went to a comet. So those are the ones that landed, um, or and and they did so by orbiting the planetary body for a while first, and then they carefully touched down and then got their sample and got back up. Very cool. Yeah, that was an exciting day. Um, how do you handle not seeing family and friends for an extended period of time? Yeah, it is really hard, isn't it? Um, I think one thing that I've been doing is I've been Skyping and um, getting on Zoom with and FaceTime and all, basically all the video platforms um, with my family and friends, but it's, it's really rough sometimes. And I think we really like playing games together. So there's, there's some, some places online where you can play games online with folks and, and then have your video on, but I think it, it's, it's a really tough thing we're, we're all going through together right now. Yeah, totally. Um, how many people have gone to space? Oh, uh, I think a couple hundred, but I don't know the exact number. Cool. Um, where are you right now? So I am in Boston. I live okay. in Boston, but this behind me is Mars. Awesome. Um, let's see. What's the smallest star that humans know of? Hmm. I'm not sure what the name would be, but it's probably one of the dwarf stars. And the reason I say that is in the, um, in the, the sun or the star life cycle, um, you know, there's, there's the supernova and they explode and they get really big. And then they kind of come back down and into the size that they are for a lot of their life. But um, over billions of years, so this is a, not like a, this happens in a year or anything, but over billions and billions of years, they kind of lose their mass as they, uh, as they get older, and eventually they they're just small again. So um, probably a probably a dwarf star. Awesome. Um, this is a scary uh, question. What would happen if you got kicked out of the space station without your mask on? Uh, you would die. Cool. Uh, well, let's see. Um, what kind of things have we found on Mars? We have found all sorts of rocks. We've found water. Um, so we're, we're really curious about the red planet and that's one of the reasons we get, we keep going back. Cool. Sorry, I haven't had coffee yet today. Woo! Uh, what is your favorite thing in space? Um, hmm. I think it's how much we just, we don't know yet. There's always more things to explore and that's one of the reasons it's a really awesome time to get into space and to, to think about what you would want to study as a scientist or an engineer. Uh, so I, I think I think that's one of the coolest things about it. Awesome. Um, all right. What so what what questions are you as a scientist trying to answer right now? So right now I'm thinking about um, how how would we actually land humans on the moon and how do we do that safely? So that, I think that's the biggest question right now. Cool. Um, do you think that space, in addition to being cool, is kind of scary? Sometimes. I'm, I'm sure there, there are moments that are scary, like, um, you know, it's, it, it, people can have different reactions to situations and maybe looking out the window and seeing that you're so far away from Earth could be scary, uh, but it's also amazing because it's this beautiful planet that we're, that we're all protecting together. Cool. Um, what is your checklist for preparing for a mission? 
Mm, okay, so checklists are really, really long to prepare for a mission. But to start, I think you would want to make sure that all of your safety gear is in place, that you have enough supplies to last whatever the duration of the mission is, that you have backups and you have backup plans in case something happens. Like what, hap what if there was a fire in space? Or what if, this, uh, what if this doesn't work when we expect it to work? So having backup plans is, is gonna be really important. Very cool. Um, uh, okay, one last question before we ask our final questions. Okay. Uh, Devin would like to know, uh, are they still trying to have people live on Mars? Oh, okay. So we are not sending people to Mars yet, but a lot of people are thinking about it and thinking about how we would do it. So if that's something you're interested in, sometimes there's even contests for, um, for kids in elementary or middle or high school that uh, ask you to design a, a space station or design a habitat or something like that. So that's actually something you can participate in right now. Cool. Um, okay, so we try to keep this at 45 minutes and we are at that time. So we've got two final questions. All right. One is, uh, what's something that you wish that everybody knew it related to your area of expertise? And then the second question is, what's something that you wish everybody knew about literally anything? It can be as silly or significant as you'd like. Okay, um, something related to my area of expertise is I wish everybody knew that there's no way we're gonna be able to do space travel by ourselves. So it is a global effort. We are gonna need all the countries and we're gonna need all types of people, not just scientists and engineers. We're gonna need lawyers and business people and people that can weld and people that can farm and all sorts of things if we are ever to have a sustainable community in space. So we need all types of people. So I wish people knew that because I think it would help them realize that space is for them too. What, whatever they happen to be. And something that I wish everybody knew in general. Um, I wish everybody knew. The thing that's popping to mind is uh, dinosaurs are really cool. That's valid. That's so great. I, I think, good. I think one of the things that just blows my mind is how long ago dinosaurs existed on our planet and how different uh, the world looked at that time. And so when we look at these other planets, like we look at Mars, you know, it, that could be what the earth looked like several billion years ago. So I think, I think that's, that's a really cool thing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Erin. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Erin. Um, let's see again, tomorrow, 5 p.m. We've uh, 5 p.m. Eastern. We've got uh, microbes with Kat Milligan Meyer. Next week is museum week. Wait, today's Thursday, right? Today Today is Thursday. Uh, next week, we're doing all museum stuff. Um, and as always, we completely rely on donor support to keep this program going and support our staff. So if you can support, please do so on patreon.com slash Skype a scientist or paypal.me slash Skype a scientist. Um, do you have anything else that you'd like to plug? Tell us about. Uh... Actually, what I usually plug is Skype scientists. So, oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and while we're at it, please tell all of your friends about this program because oh, don't worry. <laughs> on word of mouth. Uh, so, audience, you too, tell everybody because uh, we're here for you. Um, all right. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you again, Danielle and Erin. Bye. Bye.